On April 26, 1986, in the town of Pripyat, USSR, reactor number four of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was undergoing a safety test to simulate a power outage. Due to operator error and a flawed design, the reactor overheated and underwent an uncontrolled chain reaction, vaporizing the water which was meant to cool it. This caused a massive steam explosion, which tore apart the reactor and led to a huge release of radioactive material as the core melted down in an uncontrolled nuclear reaction. Years later, as researchers were using robots to investigate the area near the core, they noticed a black mold on the reactor's walls. This area was bathed in extremely high levels of radiation from the melted core and was many times the lethal dose to humans. How was the fungus able to survive? The fungus found in the reactor is known as a radiotrophic fungus. What makes it especially interesting is that not only can the fungus tolerate radiation, which would be deadly to most other creatures, but it actually grows towards it, likely using it as a source of energy. While this may seem like something out of a science fiction novel, it's really not that different from what most plants do. Plants absorb light in the visible spectrum and convert it to sugars through the chemical chlorophyll. Radiotrophic fungi capture higher energy ionizing radiation and use the chemical melanin, the same one that colors our skin and hair and provides us with protection from the sun's rays. When high energy photons hit the melanin, it changes its electric properties, leading scientists to suspect that the fungi can use the radiation for energy though the exact mechanism is still not well understood. And while this ability would at first seem like an adaptation to the modern age of atomic energy, melanin-containing fungi have existed for an incredibly long time. Rewinding now from our time all the way back to the early Cretaceous period, we have found melanized fungal spores in the sediment of this era as well. This is likely because the early Cretaceous experienced magnetic field reversals, exposing the Earth to higher radiation levels from space and creating an environment where radiation-resistant fungi could thrive. As amazing as this fungi's ability to thrive inside of a nuclear reactor, radiotrophic fungi aren't the only creatures on our planet able to withstand incredibly high levels of radiation. In fact, they're not even the best at it. That honor goes to a bacterium, Deinococcus radiodurans, which can survive a radiation dose thousands of times greater than humans can. Sometimes referred to by science journalists as Conan the Bacterium, for its ability to outlive harsh radiation, desiccation, oxidation, and more, D. radiodurans was originally discovered in an experiment which involved irradiating canned food. The purpose of the experiment was to expose the food to extremely high levels of X-ray radiation, levels thought to be high enough to sterilize the can and eradicate any organism inside. However, upon finding the food inside it spoiled, scientists isolated D. radiodurans and began studying it. What they found was truly remarkable. Upon intense radiation, D. radiodurans is subjected to enormous amounts of damage and its DNA is ripped, sometimes in hundreds of places. Its metabolism stops and its ability to create proteins is halted from the damage. It's essentially in a state which we would call death in other organisms. However, in D. radiodurans, the bacterium is able to stitch its DNA back together, repairing the damage and resuming normal cellular function. Radiation resistance isn't only limited to bacteria or fungi either. A larger organism known as the tardigrade can also withstand high doses of radiation, as well as huge temperature changes, the vacuum of space, and various toxic chemicals. And while only about the size of a period, as animals, these creatures have more in common with us than fungi or single-celled bacteria. How do tardigrades survive these extreme conditions? Tardigrades accomplish this by reverting to a ton, a sort of dried out state where they are even more immune to large environmental changes. They use a protein unique to them called Cytosolic Abundant Heat Soluble, or CAHS for short. This protein creates a scaffolding which holds their other proteins together and prohibits them from unraveling, allowing the tardigrade to weather extreme conditions, sometimes for decades. Scientists recently have taken an interest in these special proteins. They are studying the possibility of using them for vaccine storage in places where refrigeration is difficult and possibly using them to preserve blood at room temperature, a huge asset to environments like a disaster zone or battlefield where refrigeration is impossible. Another example of extremophiles aiding humans can be found with D. radiodurans. With the huge amount of toxic waste created since the start of its nuclear weapons program, 
the United States has over 3,000 sites storing waste from these projects. With its ability to repair its DNA in response to extremely high radiation levels, it's an excellent candidate to clean up certain types of this waste. By splicing in mercury-resistant genes from a type of E. coli bacteria, this new altered bacteria has resistance to mercury as well as radiation, and is well suited to altering the toxic mercury at these sites to a less toxic version. And this is why extremophiles are so important. Humans are constantly interacting with environments too hostile to support life. And while curiosities like the tardigrade are fascinating oddities of nature, extremophiles can also be extremely useful, accomplishing tasks and environments too harsh for humans, but just right for them.